You've probably heard me say this before, but a true cybersecurity practitioner or a true leader in cybersecurity has one very common pattern within them. And that is the ability to look at a problem and prevent it from becoming an emergency. If you dissect the problems that we face from an IT perspective, from a business continuity, a business operations perspective, especially in the digital ecosystems, you will know that there is not only one door that opens us to a problem. There are multiple. Responses thus must come from multiple layers. Today, we're going to learn about governance, and we're going to learn about how you open those multiple doors and maintain some level of control, preventing problems from becoming emergencies. My name is Ali Hirji. I teach and work at Durham College as well as York University. I am the lead on the Cyber Exchange Advisory, and I'm coming to you live from the Cyber Exchange Studio here at the St. Francis Center in the beautiful town of Ajax. I want to acknowledge that this land is of the peoples of the Mississaugas of the Scugog Island First Nation, and this land is governed and protected under the Williams Treatises. My guest today is someone that I've engaged with for at least the last two years, someone whose work I have followed, but more importantly, somebody who has consistently reminded me that the secret to success is that there are no secrets. He's been a part of the Cyber Exchange Advisory Board, been a part of the CISO Forum Board led by CyberX, and has been to a variety of engagements with me, including most recently, the Global Cyber Olympics. You know, often we talk about the idea of the known unknowns and the unknown knowns. My guest today is one individual who will constantly remind you that the more you learn and the more you know, the more you become aware of what you do not know. His company that he runs is called Risk Aware. And lest you be caught risk unaware, it's worthwhile engaging with him. Welcome to the Power Hour, Michael Castro. Thank you, Ali. Michael, I myself have sat on various boards. And we deal with a whole bunch of issues, from finance to operations. And now, slowly but surely, the topic around security has become a priority. Before, it was a, an item on the agenda which was categorized under other business. Today, it occupies its uh, predominant seat on our agendas. What's changed and why are board of advisors so influenced by what's going on in cybersecurity? Excellent question. The, the world today, as we know, we, as we live in, in cyber and we live in the world as it has evolved, really stems from the governance of an organization. And for the most part, for the day-to-day -day operation perspective, that's always handled by the operational, the leads, the CEO of that organization. But for many companies, for many organizations, for very, many large companies, there's another layer in this go governance model, and that is with the board of directors. Yep. We realize, and the board has for many, many years, focused on what they considered the risks to their organizations. They've been environmental risks, they've been financial risks, they've been competitor risks. And really the landscape has been about their product or service, how it impacts them, how it impacts their shareholders. But that world, as we know, has changed. And you're right, the boards of yesteryear really hardly looked at cyber as a discussion point. It really was a buried IT conversation. I've sat on many boards and I've sat in front of many boards, uh, often trying to bring the conversation of cybersecurity aware. And I can tell you that outside of a, an appearance perhaps once a year uh, with an audit committee for a board of directors or a board of governors, cyber really hasn't been a mainstay on the plate. But as the world has changed, as more organizations are impacted by cybersecurity, board members cannot stand aside and ignore the fact that things are happening to which they need to be aware of. You know, I, I clearly remember this uh, from previous power hours where we were talking about this idea that often many boards will, will look at a situation in cybersecurity and perhaps uh, come to the notion that it's too risky for us uh, to do something. And my response has always been, if you think trying something new is risky, try doing nothing. It's lethal. And going back to the aspect of when you identify problems, how you respond to them, where does an organization like Risk Aware come into the picture? Is it after the fire has started? 
Or is it at the very get-go that you're able to warn individuals and corporations how to conduct themselves? What is that point of entry for an individual like yourself? Yeah. The, we, we, we always talk about the point that a reactive response in dealing with a cyber incident after it's happened is too late. Yep. The damage is done, the impact is there, the regulators and your shareholders and the lawyers are already knocking at the door. For board members, for organizations, they need to be as proactive as possible. And that really starts with education. It starts with board members understanding truly what cyber means to them, what is their role in understanding cyber, and what is their place in being able to have that conversation with senior leadership and having, helping them be prepared proactively for when something would happen. You know, I noticed that in your work, especially as a practitioner in the space, but also coming with quite a lot of experience, you found yourself doing a lot of academic work and training as well. Besides just guiding individuals around security governance, and we'll come back to unpacking it a little bit more, you've also taken on roles where you're leading training environments. What's that been like for you? Training's a lot of fun, I have to say. It, it's, it's been in my blood for years, even before I entered into the cyberspace. Uh, but training is the key. Training is what fuels learning. And you know, many practitioners, many leaders will tell you that there never is an ending to what we do when it comes to learning. Yeah. Even myself, there's always uh, an engaged piece of learning. Now, I've been in cybersecurity for well over 20 years, approaching 25. I can tell you there's still pieces for me to learn as an individual. But as a person training, as a person educating, I find great value, great excitement in helping the next generation, helping those better understand what cyber is and helping them understand that path. You know, it's interesting. My, my son is, is heading off to, to college in the fall, hopefully. And, you know, for many hours or many years, you know, his focus was on the unknown. But suddenly he's decided that cybersecurity is the place to go. Thrilled by it personally, yeah. but it's another layer of education, another generation where, you know, he is able to, to bring that, that energy and that learning capability. We need more people to understand cyber, and for that we need some great people to help them learn that. You're practicing, you're testing, and you're training. You're sort of a one-stop solution for almost anything related to cyber that an incorporation or a large organization or a small one or any enterprise would need. But obviously you do have to do a lot of multitasking. Many CISOs that I've spoken to often talk about themselves as one of their superpowers being the ability to multitask, which is that they can listen, ignore, and forget at the same time. When you are helping organizations, especially from a governance standpoint, how do you position yourself and how do you take in all of the information and all of the noise that's coming in from multiple areas within an organization. There, there is so much that, that happens. It, it's almost like a, a sponge that a, a CISO or a security leader has to be. And that, that sponge and that capability is to understand many breadths of the organization, many areas and impacts and sections that will have that responsibility and how that all plays in to getting to that ultimate goal. That ultimate goal, of course, being the protection of that organization. As a empowerer, uh, as a practitioner, as a consultant, as a, as a security leader, you know, I've learned through the many years and through the many roles that I've had that you cannot just listen or just speak to one person. You have to be open, you have to be mindful, you have to be able to, to understand and weed through the pieces of importance but also the nuggets of the information that lies beneath it. There's no one report, there is no one piece of information, there's no one person in any organization that you can totally rely on for everything that you need to do to either do your job or to be able to convey the message and the information that you need to do to be able to help others. Obviously, you work with a variety of frameworks. There are a number of frameworks that you must be using on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, we talk about the standards with NIST, ISO standards, whatever have you. But I want to go back to a conversation that I had in a previous Power Hour with another one of our advisory champions, and that was this idea that frameworks are there, but you can't automate design. 
To some extent, you can design what you automate. And there's a fundamental difference there. How do you create frameworks for governance? Is it a one-size-fits-all solution? Or do you take that time to go through each layer of the organization before developing a governance structure? You know, there, there are many frameworks today, and there's some very strong, very powerful frameworks when it comes to security. I wish we could take just one model and apply it like a, like a paint uh, or a, a coat of paint, yeah. uh, but we cannot. Um, it, it, there's so much involved in the size of the organization, what they do, how they do it, what they're providing, their products, their service, their offerings, their size. What has worked for me, what has really been that piece is to look at all the frameworks. And, and the reality is that many of the frameworks have the same fundamentals, the same backbones. They're set in a different way, they're set in, in more or less words, but the principles and the guidance are there to be shared across the board. I find that the best solution is to look first at the organization, look first at what their needs are, where they are, what their maturity is, and really what is defining their path, and then find something suitable. If that is a hybrid, if that is a mixture, that is okay. Because at the end of the day, we want to build a model that can be achievable, can, can meet a level of compliance, and ultimately make the, the organization more resilient. It's not about checking boxes. It's not about tacking a certificate on a wall of completion. It's about making that organization more resilient and, and stronger to be able to handle the, the threats of today. I agree, and many of our colleagues, uh, or your colleagues as well, on the Cyber Exchange Advisory have warned against checkbox security. And I want to extend that just a little bit further. As a virtual CISO, you're obviously engaging with a variety of corporations, different stripes, different folks. Are there certain industries that you're seeing are more gravitated towards maintaining a virtual CISO? Or is it kind of, it's industry agnostic and in that you're seeing your services being absorbed by a variety of industries? Uh, good question again. You know, I've come from a background of corporate uh, organizations and being a CISO and a leader in some very large organizations. Uh, they have a strength of, of, of not only resources, capability, and budget, in which case a large team can be ascertained, it can be brought forward, it can help bring that battle. When we look at the role of a virtual CISO, however, we're looking at organizations that either do not have the capability, the budget, or the understanding even of where security leadership fits in. You know, I look at the organizations that I talk to, I look at the organizations that I assist, and they come from a variety of places. You know, I work with startups, I work yep. with non-for-profits, I work with financial organizations, I work with tech companies. All of them are, are unique in their way, but they all have the same need. And that is a gap in truly understanding what security is. It's not just technology. And technology has that large, large piece. And yes, we always talk about people, um, process, and technology being the three corners of security. But really, technology, fundamentally, an organization can go out and buy the technology. But to not understand what the technology is, what it does, why you need it, or why it's the right piece of technology, that's where that virtual CISO fits in. I think there, it's a very large, growing area where organizations are saying, hey, I can tap into somebody who understands, somebody who can help me with that roadmap, help me get down the path that I need to go on, help me learn and help educate my organization at a level that I never thought I could do without having a large team or focusing or committing to, to uh, hiring uh, a security leader. You know, in the words of the famous Brazilian soccer player, uh, Pele, practice is everything. How do you ensure that once you've gotten into an organization that they are practicing what you have preached to them from the altar of cybersecurity? <laughs> and I love Pele too. <laughs> and uh, you know, that the, one of the, the, the mandates, one of the fundamental statements that I've always said, not only to, to those who worked with me, those who've worked for me, but also yep. those to whom I work for, is continuous improvement. Yeah. You know, we can build a model, we can raise the bar, we can put in the capabilities, the processes, the policies, the tools. We can even educate and have a, a large push on knowledge right at the start. But like anything, without that, 
that exercising, without that testing, without the continuous improvement model, it'll all go to the wayside. We've heard and you've heard many times that cyber is ever evolving. It truly is. You know, the model of, I can tell you, that I entered in 21 years ago is far from the model that I see today. Yeah. Um, but to keep it exciting, to keep it ever-changing, to keep it to want people to understand why it's changing, where it's changing from, and where those new things are, that is what makes it exciting. I love cyber. I have loved cyber since the day I entered the model, and it's because of that ever-changing. But that ever-changing also makes it the most difficult. In the world of specialists, consultants, especially technical specialists, you have this, uh, this notion where a lot of us, and I include myself in this umbrella, is that we like to keep our specialist skills to ourselves. Let me give you a little bit of a story here. You know how often we talk about this idea of uh, if you see a hungry individual, if you give them a fish, they'll eat for a day. But if you teach that person how to fish, they'll, uh, they'll eat for a lifetime. I like to reverse that a little bit and say, that person that's hungry, if you feed them for the day, or at least a couple of days, they'll now have enough energy to go on their own and learn what they need to learn in order to feed themselves. It is about the state of mind. It is about empowering individuals in cybersecurity and not sort of turning around and saying, hey, this is the domain of the Michael Castro. This is the domain of the risk awares. How do you empower those around you to feel that they're not just following the rules, but they're playing an active role in ensuring the organization's posture is secure and safe and less risk intensive at all times. And that's where the word risk and aware come together. Yeah. You know, it's, it's you know, a world where being a security consultant is about going in, being the SME, being the smart and the one who knows cybersecurity and empowering and bringing that energy and those solutions to them. But being an educator, being a teacher, and being a part of a team at what makes the difference between a very smart, strong consultant and a partner in the solution. You know, I look to help organizations who want to learn, to want to at some point stand on their own and not have to rely on a person like myself. Sure, there'll be situations where, you know, those similar to myself will go in to help those that can't help themselves. But that has to shift from helping fix and helping build a solution to helping build a model, a roadmap, a, a path for self-sufficiency. And that involves teaching, that involves supporting, that involves not being afraid to, to have that knowledge transfer to allow those people or that organization to stand alone. I never want to be in a, in, a, in a scenario where I am the only person who understands cyber because no one person in any organization can really solve the, the problems and the dangers lurking within that space. You know, we've often held this true to our practices that it's not about making uh, or counting the hours, it's about making those hours count. How do you measure the progress that an organization is making from a cybersecurity perspective? Is it purely data and quantitatively, uh, quantitatively driven? Or is it qualitatively driven? Or is it a mix of two? You know, it has to be, Ali, a mixture of the two, right? Yeah. I've struggled for years trying to quantify cyber, especially yeah. for senior leaders and to boards uh, when I've been on the IT side yeah. to really try to quantify how security is moving forward and metrics and measurements have always been tough because either they truly don't help appreciate or help them understand the risk or it doesn't really help paint the picture of what the scenario is. On the other side, it's very easy on a qualitative side to yeah. paint a picture that doesn't really have a measurement. It becomes too fluffy, yeah. too easy to, to use words that sound like progress is made when in fact it isn't. I think really it's a mixture of both. You have to be able to look at some measurement of some sort and see, are we doing the right thing? You know, attacks on the firewalls, the number of viruses on an outbreak, only are a measurement in time. You know, when it could be that is the day that an organization felt the pain of some hacker deciding to, to, to take it out on them. But it doesn't mean that a decrease from that number is a win in the column of cybersecurity. 
It has to be about engagement. It has to be about how uh, security is uh, approached and appreciated in the, in the organization. It can be on the success of reporting phishing. It can be on the ability of, of individuals to not be clicking on malware. It can actually be on the success of antivirus not firing because right. that could mean that people then are not getting to a point where they're having to rely on antivirus. So I never wanted to send any um, group in a path to, to have an expectation of how to explain progress. It involves a conversation and it involves a journey that which they have to be prepared to look at and be open-minded on. Yeah. You know, I've often maintained this position that you know, cybersecurity practitioners and professionals speak the many languages of understanding. You have to speak to different individuals from C-suite, uh, C-suite from a finance perspective, from an administrative standpoint, but also to IT practitioners as well. How have you tailored your practice to ensure that the CAO is understanding what the CEO needs to, and at the same time, the CIO or the CFO is also understanding what they need to as well? I think the many years of working in corporate teach yep. you a lot of things about business. The word I always use is acumen. An individual, a true security leader, a true CISO or virtual CISO has to understand all sides of the fence. Now you think there are only two sides of the fence, the, the technical side and the business side, but there's also the user side and there's also the generalist side yep. that one has to look at as well. As a technologist, and I can say that I have been for many, many years a technologist, it's easy to get wrapped up into where technology fits, be able to speak with your peers, be able to understand what's happening on the firewalls, interpret logs, understanding what patching does, understanding the solutions that have to be built on the technology side. But that information can't be just transferred over word for word and verbatim when one is speaking to senior leaders and especially not when speaking to boards. Yep. You have to have that business acumen and that capability to translate, to bring forward that conversation in a way that a business can understand why it's happening, what is the impact of it, what is the risk associated, and what does it mean to their organizations. Put in that mix the ability to, to speak to individuals throughout an organization, not only the senior leaders, but everyone else within a company, and of course, as I mentioned, with the board as well. And we're looking at the many layers that really defines you know, a good leader for an organization when it comes to cyber versus someone who's very good on one single facet. You know, the, the pandemic has taught us for sure that amongst many things, just as, abs as absurd as it is to say, build it and they'll come, it's just as absurd to say, you know, hide it and they won't ask. What happens in a situation where something goes wrong? A breach happens. I'm asking this because out in the cyber exchange community, there's been a lot of talk about cybersecurity insurance. And as a virtual CISO, is that something that you're also dealing with in terms of, should something happen, here are the insurances that you require? You know, when I look at, you know, I look at cyber insurance, and okay. it's interesting because cyber insurance 10 years ago, five was, years ago, uh, didn't even exist. Persona non grata. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of organizations, a lot of leaders believe that cyber insurance is that, that golden Silver nugget, bullet, is yeah. that <laughs> shield that's going to protect their organizations. You know, sometimes when I go in, you know, one of the first questions I'm asked is, do we need insurance? What can we do to insure this company, both from a policy perspective or what do we need to do to put up that barrier? Yeah. You know, I'll give the same answer. I'm sure all of those in, in my side of the house will say there are no silver bullets, yeah. there are no one solutions, and there never will be. Cyber insurance, great tool to have in an organization's tool chest. And I say this for two reasons. One is because it's going to help that company when they're in that reactive position. It won't protect them from being attacked, it's not going to stop the attack, but it's going yeah. to help them deal with the ramifications sure. of that attack. The cost to bring in the forensic teams, to rebuild their systems, to gain back the trust that they need to do. But a good piece of what I say is a true benefit of getting cyber insurance is that the, the insurance company has an expectation of that organization when they want to buy and procure cyber insurance. It's not a fill out a form and we'll, we'll give it to you. Yeah. 
The insurance company wants to know what that organization is doing. A, B, C, D, down the list. And, you know, I go in many times and tell organizations, if you say we do nothing, either they're not going to give it to you or they're going to charge you a hefty premium. Okay. You're always better to take that information, see what they're looking for, and marry that up against what you're doing. If you're not doing those things that that insurance company is hoping that you're doing, then you already have a problem. And that is an eye-opener for some companies. And sometimes a good first step to say, maybe we should try to fix some of these problems before we embrace, before we bring in that insurance. So part of the tool chest, absolutely. The one area where they should spend all their security budget, never. Yeah. And you know, when you're talking about the one area where you should spend your security budget, it's obviously defined by understanding what the parameters are and what the breach factors could be and what could happen to an organization in the event of something uh, unhappy from a security perspective. As a virtual CISO, you're now obviously realizing that, uh, well, you've known this for a while, is that the enterprise now has many faces. It has, an, it has a face within a on-prem corporate location, but now it's got a diverse spread environment where you've got people working from home as well. How has this changed your work, and how is this changing your approach to security? So, you know, there are many arguments on what a true perimeter is. Yeah. When I first started in cyber, and again, I always pull out my age when I do that, you know, we really did hide behind a wall. We had an office, we had a perimeter, we had a firewall, and all our systems, including our web servers, our email, everything were within those walls. Yep. And we allowed people into those, through those walls that we trusted through VPN or other connections. Yep. That isn't the case anymore. And that has never come so obvious with the pandemic and what has happened in the, in the world within 2020. You know, the remote worker model, it's nothing new, but it really has opened the eyes of organization into where their weakness becomes. So where cloud has already extended those perimeters, where using SaaS uh, and other services, AWS, Azure, Office 365, have already blown through the door that once was that perimeter. Yeah. They held their own perimeters. They still allowed an organization to have not one, but a handful of perimeters. Now, with the large proportion of individuals working now remotely, organizations now have tenfold the perimeters that they once yeah. had, because they have to not only worry about the large assets, the large areas that they need to protect, but they also have to worry about their one user who works in finance, yep. who lives in a condo with a weak Wi-Fi router oh and God. a system that no longer can be patched and yep. without true access to a help desk. That has become that new risk. We have seen cyber risks and cyber hacks explode since April. Yep. You know, the, the drive towards attacking organizations has turned towards driving towards attacking individuals to seeking out ISPs and IPs on those networks to which we all log into and we create yep. our own internet and find those systems and those weaknesses. We can't expect everyone in an organization yep. to be an expert, let alone a security expert. But, you know, it has brought new challenges and it has brought new ways that organizations have to look at not only how they spend and how they prepare for cyber, but how they continue to evolve the model of protection that they need to seek. You know, the greatest leaders emerge out of adversity. And I want to take the next five minutes that we have to really talk about your perspective on where, as an economy and as a community, that we're heading to. You've talked to us about the importance of governance. You've talked to us about the uh, importance of proactive measures from a security standpoint. And you've underscored the need for realizing that security is not, as have many speakers before you, not a plug-and-play solution. But you need to obviously have that vision of what's coming and you need to understand context and you need to think through a lot of the information that we have. We need to have a solid practice around threat intelligence and information gathering. From a national perspective, given the amount of experience that you have, do you feel that the Canadian economy has been ready for some of the evolving threats in the security market? Quite honestly, no. I think that, you know, really as, as a nation, as Canada is, you know, there are always those pieces that government needs to, to take, a, take a hold of, 
and citizens need to take a hold of as well. You know, we have relied greatly on large or organizations, corporations, yep. and really a lot of breadth of where those security capabilities lie within Canada um, to help protect the, the, the country as a whole. You know, we look to the government and it's pledged to protect us, but we realize our biggest threats are offshore. Yep. Our biggest threats are not from the individuals that live within our neighborhood, but on those that we as ourselves or even our own enforcement capabilities cannot protect us from. We all have to have a piece in this. And when I say we all, it goes beyond even organizations, but citizens have to do their part too. Yep. We look at the scams that are coming on today. We look at all the efforts on identity theft and yep. everything else that happens. I implore everyone to always focus on their own worlds, their social medias, their bank accounts, their own worlds where security plays a part and they need to learn too. You know, knowledge, we've said it over and over in these, these last few minutes, knowledge is critical for everyone. Everyone has the part to play. Michael, you spend a lot of time with boards of advisors, different in, uh, individuals and corporations that are in charge of, or at least at the helm, of making some very important decisions. What are some of the important things that you need have to be put to the table when you're making a decision around cybersecurity? For example, when you're making a decision, let's say around a particular route for revenue generation, you look at the profit and loss model, you look at the cost benefit analysis, you look at certain staple factors before you decide whether a particular revenue route makes sense or a particular new venture makes sense. What are some of those data points you need to have at the table before you make a decision around security? So many organizations focus on their return on investment or ROI when they're looking at projects or directions of, of going. And boards of directors obviously look at very large capital expenses yep. and very large capital projects of what they want to do. I will always say that security, with the exception of a few things, never has a return on, it, on its investment. Really what it has is a, is a measurable return on loss, okay. meaning you know, the organization has to look at what is the potential for loss if cybersecurity is not part of that picture. You know, we can always say that security can have a piece to stand on its own, to invest directly in security as a blanket for an organization. But we also, in organizations, and I will tell them that they also have to invest in security when they're looking to invest in anything that they're doing. They have to look at where cyber fits into every single piece of that path and that roadmap that they want to take as an organization and not look at it as an IT function, not look at it as a bolt-on after the fact, but as a part of the journey that they want to take as they go down a path towards new opportunities for them as a business. Boards of directors understand the need to spend money. You need to spend money to make money. Yeah. That's the principle of Business 101. Right. Um, but you need to spend part of that money on security to help you ensure that where you want to go, you succeed at. For our audience, could you recommend a book or a movie that can get them to understand how you view the world of cybersecurity? So one of my favorite movies uh, and I go back, oh, I don't know what year it is. We'll say in the 90s. Sure. Will Smith, Gene Hackman, uh -huh. Enemy of the State. Great movie about the understanding of how Big Brother and how connected the world truly is. And when we learn on how we have cameras today, how we have the Internet of Things, how so much we do in every aspect is being watched, it's very easy to see how an attack can, can or how a hack can give people access to so much information. I look at that movie and when I watch it from time to time, it reminds me again on how we cannot take for granted our security and really it is our insecurity that really drives the way we have to fix life and look to improve the way we do things. So, Enemy of the State, Will Smith. The walls have ears, absolutely. I now have the task of summarizing this uh, very interesting conversation. And I'm going to do my best to provide my two rupees of analysis on this. To the audience that's listening, before I thank Michael Castro for his time and his expertise, and also thank him on behalf of CyberX, I hope you've taken from this what I just have. 
And that is we're constantly in this race to improve and make better our futures. The truth of the matter is that you cannot change your futures. You can change your habits. And surely your habits can change your future. Learn, think through what it is that you're doing when you're engaging online, and be good digital citizens by constantly paying homage to what are the best practices set by not just the institution you work for, study within, but also by the governance models that we operate within here in Canada. You know, one of the great things of engaging with Michael Castro is that you find in the most unknown and hidden places true gems of cybersecurity. You know, when he was with us at the Global Cyber Olympics and we were engaging and discussing around a matter of things, he spent a lot of time with the president of Durham College, Don Lavisa. And there was something that came out of that conversation which I'll share with you and bid Michael Castro adieu. And that was often it is at the very back end row of the classroom that you find the most talented individuals. And that's the nature of cybersecurity. Just because you're not involved with it academically or technically doesn't mean that you cannot think through that process. You've lived it in more ways than you can imagine. Michael, with that, I'll bid you adieu, and I'll remind our community that you can catch Michael not only at future sessions with CyberX, not only on the cyberexchange.ca community, but also at his company and corporation, RiskAware. If you want to reach out to him, you can reach out to him directly or connect with him on cyberexchange.ca. I look forward to hosting you and my next guest at the next iteration of Power Hour. Thank you, Michael, for putting the power in Power Hour. Thank you. Take care, Michael.